Hey everybody, Mike Henson here for ALS News Now. Um, and also, if you'd like to follow my Twitter account, please do that at uh, ALS underscore now. Today's show is going to be incredible. Um, one of the most commonly asked questions that I get is, what can I do? Uh, if you are newly diagnosed with ALS, um, if you know somebody who's newly diagnosed, if you know uh, of somebody who knows of somebody, uh, you know, please tell them to subscribe to my channel because what we do here is a little different than most people. This is not a channel where we focus on uh, supplements or natural homeopathic remedies. What we do here at ALS uh, News Now is we focus on actual medical therapies uh, for ALS and how we can get those into the bodies of people uh, quickly. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe to our sister uh, Facebook group, which is the No More Excuses group on Facebook, where we lead a activist group that is working on currently trying to get um, a number of things done, including FDA approval uh, of a uh, product that is in phase three right now called Neurone from Brainstorm Therapeutics. Uh, we're trying to get a, a couple of other therapies uh, pushed through as quickly as possible. Um, this is an interesting time in ALS because for the first time, there are three therapies which have now uh, proven themselves to either slow, stop, or reverse the effects of ALS progression for the first time in history. These are legitimate FDA uh, trial track drugs. Uh, one of them actually is going through the process in Australia, but again, through the through the legitimate means. Uh, these are not um, supplements or homeopathic remedies. These are real, actual uh, drugs that have been developed over the course of time, many of them for as much as a decade or more. Actually, all three of them are coming up on 10 years now. Uh, the closest one to market is the Neurone stem cell, uh, autologous stem cell procedure, which is currently in phase three and is about halfway finished, I would say, roughly. Um, but that's not fast enough. There's a lot of people out there right now who have ALS who are not going to make it if we do not provide answers to these questions of how we stop the disease. Uh, that's why today's guest is so interesting. Um, I'd like to introduce you in a moment to a man named Warren Osborne. Uh, Warren uh, is a businessman, uh, a venture capitalist. Um, he is uh, from the Utah area and has recently become very popular in the ALS community for what he has done. And, uh, you know, I will say from the outset that most of us uh, will not be able to afford uh, what he has done. But I don't really look at that as a negative at this point because what he has done has you is essentially he has used himself as a guinea pig to prove and to develop new therapy deliveries and, and modalities, as he likes to call them, for stem cell deliveries uh, into his own body. He has made himself into a guinea pig. Uh, yes, he can afford to do these things, and I'm, I'm certainly glad that he can because what we've learned and what you're going to learn from his results today are pretty shocking. Um, although ALS, I'm not, I'm not ready to use, nor is he, to use the term cured, what we have found is that, and what he has demonstrated, is that through an aggressive therapeutic program of stem cell delivery, he is now a stronger person than he was before he had ALS. Now, that's an incredible statement, incredible statement. And I'm going to let you watch the interview here in a moment and decide for yourself. But Warren is highly credible. He is obviously highly intelligent. A uh, man of, of means to be able to do these things, very aggressive, very much a problem solver. And I think you're going to be impressed. Um, you know, Warren has uh, gone to China and Mexico. Uh, he's investigated, uh, you know, Korea. Uh, Warren is also fluent in Chinese, I might add, from doing business there. So he has a unique ability to uh, understand exactly what they're what they're really saying over there, and, and speak directly to uh, the Chinese two Chinese um, uh, stem cell clinics, the Wu Center and 
uh, I believe the other one is uh, Fu Wa, I believe. We're going to find out. Uh, sorry if I didn't say that right, but he's going to clarify that. Um, let me introduce you now to a very fascinating man named Warren Osborne. Warren, how are you today? Good to see you. Great. Great to be with you today. Awesome. Uh, people know the story of your diagnosis, I think, uh, mostly, um, but why don't we just touch on that just quickly. We're going to have a lot of new people watching for the first time who have, uh, you know, who, who want to experience and, and, and maybe look into some of the things that you've done. So I was diagnosed uh, May 10th of, of 2008, last year. And in that diagnosis, I had been previously pre-diagnosed by a non-ALS specialist. And then I got to an ALS specialist up at the University of Utah ALS clinic. And as everyone with ALS experiences, it was a traumatic, huge blow. Just kind of knock you off your feet. Mm -hmm. Now, I had previously previous to that had self-diagnosed, but only given myself maybe a 40% chance of having ALS. And then on that date of the 10th of May, 2018, we received the confirmation that it was ALS. Even turned to the uh, doctor and said, is there some chance, like maybe a 5-10% chance that this is you know, benign fasciculation syndrome or disorder or Lyme disease or something else? And he okay. responded, zero. Okay. ALS. I'm giving you a full on diagnosis. I yes. think he wanted to make sure that I received the message. This is ALS and I got to address my affairs. That was the second diagnosis. The first one was okay. a non-ALS neurologist and he wasn't as definitive. He was probable like 60% chance. This was an ALS expert specialist and he was 100% certain. I wasn't as certain. I was still holding out for a 5%, 10% chance it was Lyme disease or something else. But prior to that, I had self-diagnosis noted earlier, several months earlier, as likely ALS or possibly ALS, I was doing a lot of research. And the brainstorm your own clinical trials were screaming positive hope mm -hmm. in their they face were. too. Yes, they are. And uh, there are other trials going on in Israel and other places around the world that were showing a lot of hope where people were reversing symptoms. Now, as I you dig into it, it appears that most of those uh, short-term reversals and symptom improvements don't last a long time. I'm not aware of anybody publishing multi-year uh, claims with stem cells. Agreed. But they were at least showing short-term significant bumps and improvement. And in phase two, it looked like most of the, or all of the 36 people in the double blind control neuron study were showing improvement. So I was bullish on that and I wanted to get involved with that. I turned to my neurologist and I said, what do you think about stem cells? I'm really excited about them. I've been studying and reading them. And he turned to me and said, quote, there's not a shred of evidence that stem cells or any other alternative treatment works. Don't waste your precious time or money on stem cells or any alternative treatment. That was kind of a blow because I was there to try not just to get diagnosed, but to find out what I could do to help myself and uh, to, to improve the circumstances. I also asked him how long, um, you know, how long I would have to, to live. And he, he suggested that if I'm normal, basically, Basically, 90% of people would live two to four years in total. And my most acute ALS symptoms have been going on for six months. So he said, if you're normal, you've got about a year and a half to three and a half years of life. So, of course, I was pretty blown away, but I was already biting at the bit, ready to go do stem cell treatments. Right. Uh, in fact, the day after... Uh, my diagnosis, I booked my flights and within three days after I was down in Florida at a stem cell clinic uh, doing uh, umbilical cord stem cells injected intrathecally. So okay. I jumped on it quickly before any more serious progression occurred. It seems like most everybody, Warren, frankly, that I know that gets ALS seems to be kind of a, that type of person. They want to do something. They don't want to just sit around and wait. Uh, you jumped on this quick. 
It went well. They also included hyperbaric oxygen. I had four sessions of hyperbaric. The stem cells, uh, in hindsight, were a little too low in quantity. They wanted to do around three, three and a half million. I paid extra and pushed them up to doing five million. Contrast that with how many I'm doing now. I'm doing 50 to 70 million intrathecally per session now. But I was unaware of the scale at that time. Okay. Uh, so I only went there the one time, did the five hyperbaric oxygen, did intrathecal injection, came home. I, I can't say that I noticed any physical improvement other than maybe just a little bit better sense of overall health and wellness. Okay. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really notice any strength improvement. Now to back up a little bit further, from January of 2018 till July of 2018, I lost between about 20 and 33% of my upper body strength, depending on which muscle. I do 11 lifts at the gym and have been doing them for decades. So three sets of 10, I know exactly what I can do. Wow. And I was watching myself decline pretty consistently from January till July of 2018. Interesting. So you um, had a baseline for strength already uh, pretty well established, and you knew exactly... But, what your strength was at any given time. So oh. you could literally watch yourself uh, decline. Established for more than a decade. Wow. Uh, That's incredible. A very consistent amount. And then doing all those lifts. And I track all those and report them to, to you know, Dr. Richard Bedlack, who's my neurologist, ALS neurologist now. Yeah, well, and no, I continue sure. to track all, the, all that. But it was a sickening experience walk, watching myself decline. And during that time period, after being diagnosed, I also reached out to Neuro and I did, was disqualified because I had quickly done the umbilical cord stem cells mm -hmm. and they wouldn't take, wouldn't, wouldn't take me in having done other stem cells. So I continued to research even more fervently. Matter of fact, to date, I'm over 38,000 pages of ALS research. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is, has been on stem cells. Yes. So I became very determined to continue with umbilical cord stem cells, but to add in bone marrow derived autologous stem cells, which was the next big round. Um, in all of my research, I checked into about 23 different facilities around the world. Okay. And uh, a place in Korea was a top choice. Um, okay. Core STEM was high up, Hanyang University. They're a few years ahead of the US in bone marrow stem cell treatment for ALS. They are so that's indeed. who I would have yes. chosen. Then I spoke with an individual named Rafael Gonzalez, who's done clinical trials with Harvard. He's a stem cell expert. And he recommended another facility called Sentiel down in Guadalajara. Right. And I was very intrigued with that. And in that conversation with him, I asked how we could get to the brain and the spine through another modality other than just intrathecally. And he suggested a catheterization to the carotid artery and was intimately aware of a doctor at Sentiel who was expert in this modality. And his belief was the stem cells, some of them would penetrate the blood brain barrier and actually get to the brain. That potential of hitting the brain and the spine with a one-two punch instead of only intrathecally tipped me over to go to Sentiel instead of to Corstam or other places around the world. Right. Uh, some of these other places around the world have more, I would say, mainstream science and trials behind them. Like in South Korea, they went through all the phases of clinical trials as proved by the government as a treatment for ALS. Right. Didn't have that in Guadalajara. But it was a very, very similar, if not the exact same process. But now I could do the additional process at Sentiel of having the carotid artery injection and also getting muscle uh, injections and uh, other forms of injections. They're all under one, one house. So I went there. The first treatment was last August of, two, okay. August of 2000. 18 there, right? Is this it 18, right here? It says yep. August 16th of 2018, yep. right? So you went there yeah, first. Yeah, and this really impressed me with Sentiel. Yes. We found out that I had Epstein-Barr and two other viruses in my history. 
Once they found that out, they declined taking me to do the intrathecal injection. Wow. And that was really impressive because I think most stem cell clinics wouldn't have declined taking in a very large sum of money to have all this treatment, but right. they put safety as a first priority. And I've been really impressed with that. Been down there like eight, eight different times for treatments and they wouldn't do the intrathecal injection. They thought if I had a virus in my bone marrow and that went in into my spine, I could get meningitis. It could be very, sure. very dangerous. Yes. So they took my bone marrow, okay. they extracted it, right. sent it to, to three different labs, had all three labs verified there was no viruses in my bone marrow before okay. they would do the intrathecal injection. Okay. Then I went back a month later and did the intrathecal injection. However, they were willing to do the carotid artery injection. Okay. And you think about that, it, it's not really adding any risk. If that virus is in my system, it right. was already in my blood system. And so adding that to the carotid already wouldn't expose uh, any more than I've already been exposed. Uh, so they did the, the catheterization to the carotid. Within okay. about 30 to 45 days after doing my first treatment at Centiel, I started to feel some strength improvement. Wow. And that strength improvement continued to grow over the next six months to where six to eight months later, I was lifting more at the gym, equal or more than I was before I got ALS. First of all, that's incredible. Yeah. Now, what what the audience doesn't know is that you and I had spoken once before uh, to do an interview for my documentary that is still in the works, but kind of got sidetracked with all the other stuff that's been going on lately. But uh, I'm kind of glad that happened, though, Warren, because I want to make it clear that you went through... Uh, a slight period where you felt a little bit more of a decline, right, recently. And so we'll get back yes. to the centiole here in a moment, but I'm glad we kind of waited to release the, uh, you know, the documentary interview with you because um, you kind of went down a little bit like you felt, and then and then now you feel like you have been able to rectify that situation even. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. So I went from August of last year until – mid Q1 of this year, improving every month with strength improvements and feeling even a lessening of, of cramps and fasciculations. Okay. But then I went for about two and a half to three months period of time this year where things started to get a little worse. Right. That's what you And said, yes. fasciculations were getting worse. Cramps were getting worse. Now, a lot of neurologists will tell you, and they've told me, you can't track ALS based upon fasciculations or cramps. There's too many environmental factors. Now, I personally believe it is an indication, but it's not verifiable okay. because I will note this, and this is huge. If I overexert myself physically, like playing three hours of tennis instead of two hours of tennis, or work out really hard at the gym or I don't get my sleep or I get a lot of jet lag or I fly on a plane for 20 hours. All of those things that induce fatigue and also heat, extreme heat does it. Any any form of that fatigue causes my symptoms to increase considerably. Interesting. Uh, so, but what was interesting is during this two and a half months period of time where I was kind of declining or increasing in fasciculations and cramps, I, I didn't lose any any measurable strength however i noticed that it was more difficult for me to do the same lifts i'm a very determined person so i'm doing all these lifts at the gym and i think yeah, i was just exerting everything right. i had Using and just more effort really lunging to get it done yeah. so i never tracked any measurable loss but i could tell that it was much harder for me to do it Okay. To do the lifts. So I only did two catheterizations to the carotid artery because I think there is some stroke risk by doing that procedure. Maybe one in a few thousand, but some risk. Right. I also did more homework on the doctor who performs this at Centiel and found that there's he's never had a stroke from doing these and he's done thousands of them, never had any major incident from doing it. So I decided to repeat that procedure a month ago 
uh, or almost a month ago. And that was right after going to China and doing neuro stem cells in China, three okay. treatments over a 12 week period of time. Okay. So I did that in China, came okay. home for two days, did the catheterization and IV treatments at, at Centiel. And then within about a week to 10 days after that, all of these more intense fasciculations of the prior three months declined considerably. And the cramps have gone down considerably. I'm talking about cramps being maybe 15 to 20 percent of what they were a month ago. Okay. Fasciculations are probably half as intense as what they were a month ago. Okay. So I think I think we have both going on. I think the stem cells are are helping, okay. but we can't definitively point to which one of those treatments or both caused it. The last few weeks, I'm feeling like I'm. I'm Maybe on an upward again. trend. Okay. Upward uh, trend, yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, Warren, one of the things that you and I have talked about before is, and I believe that is unique about your approach, and that is sorely lacking from my, from Western medicine and the way we do things here with the FDA, is this so-called cocktail approach, you know, that was used against HIV and AIDS. And I think one of the things that, that you did that was kind of unique was is to bypass a lot of the trial time uh you know can you imagine how long it would have taken to get a trial done for uh inter you know for a for a uh, catheterization procedure to deliver stem cells it would have been a decade possibly so but you you know your ability to do these things co you know uh concurrently and to have the resources to be able to do these it's interesting and i think that's probably why frankly you're having so much success do you want to talk a little bit about the you know this cocktail effect that you believe that that is working to yeah. control your als yeah well there are many different types of stem cells and uh each of the clinical trials that are out there are doing one type of stem cell at a time that's right and i'm not aware of any stem cell expert who actually believes that stem cells are going to cure als um but the, all the clinical trials for each of the different types of stem cells appear to be helping slow progression or even giving short-term, you know, material improvement. So I've done uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells, umbilical cord stem cells, and neural stem cells, which really come from fetus neurotissue. Right. All three of those. Now, I have not yet done adipose tissue, which comes from fat stem cells or amniotic uh, fluid or amniotic epithelial stem cells, okay. but I'm considering doing those in the near future. Okay. All right. Um, but the theory is each, each type of different stem cell will do different types of repair properties. And all these different stem cells are a little bit unique in their in the way that they heal, reduce inflammation, encourage other cells in the body to heal. So my theory is that there's a higher chance of actually healing the whole problem by using multiple types of stem cells than just using one. But to get that through the FDA is currently an impossibility because they only allow one thing at a time. And I That's respect right. the double blind, single controlled methodology and science to try to figure out what item it is that's doing it. But I don't have the time to wait with having ALS with Absolutely. two to four years of total life expectancy to try one thing at a time. So I'm doing all of these simultaneously with taking 90 supplement doses per day, simultaneously with doing dozens of other detoxing, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, and all other right. types of, of treatments. And I'm doing them all at the same time. So it's impossible to actually claim that any one thing was solely responsible. But I'm I a, agree. if I had to bet my life on either taking umbilical cord stem cells or bone marrow derived stem cells or mixing them, I would absolutely take the the approach of mixing them. I'd rather have three different mechanics working on my car. They each had a different specialty than sure. one specialist. Right. And so that's kind of my theory. So I'm, I'm actually going to even do more. I'm going to repeat the neuro stem cells in China. 
I went to the Wu Medical Center the first time. I'm likely going to go to Puhua Medical Center the next time. Okay. And and I may be doing uh, human amniotic epithelial stem cells in the near future as well. Okay. Um, and that's one thing I want to make clear for, for our viewers here is that also uh, Warren has, uh, I believe, his full regimen online. And like you just said, he doesn't do just stem cells. He has an entire list of uh, supplements and that kind of thing that he does. And, and one thing I will say is that, uh, you know, if we look at this on a little deeper level, you know, many people are taking supplements um, and the supplements alone don't seem to be producing results, Warren, like you said, uh, yet the neuro procedure does seem to be producing results. So I'm with you. I think if I had to uh, look at this logically, what one could say would be maybe that these supplements are helping you, but it's it's not enough to get the body over the hump, so to speak, to, to being healed. I, uh, I know. would definitely agree. I, I actually don't believe there's any supplement known. And I've, I was up to a point where I was actually taking 68 supplements twice a day at the peak. I remember that. I've already oh, retired man. over 102 supplements that I used to take okay. that I no longer take. Okay. But I think the supplements help set the stage for overall homeostasis, overall health. Okay. But I don't think they are responsible for symptom reversal with ALS. First of all, most of those don't even penetrate the central nervous system Absolutely. and True. get into the yes. brain. That's right. But but because the cocktail approach of supplementation with detoxing, with stem cells, with all the other treatments that I'm doing, which I have, you know, published it online multiple times. Yes. And I'll put a link to that while to make sure, it you know. all as a cocktail approach, I experienced strength improvement and I'm stronger now than I was when I got ALS. I don't want to stop it entirely. So I still take, you know, 46 supplements twice a day. Right. Don't stop uh, it if it's working. Uh, now, is your, uh, and we'll put the link up, of course, when you when you provide that, but have you updated your, because uh, that's, that's the question everybody's asking right now. I can hear him screaming in my earphones. Where is his entire protocol at? And of course, we, we do have your stem cell protocol and with your permission, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll post that. But, you know, uh, do you have your, your updated supplement protocol somewhere as well yeah. right now? Yeah, I'll I'll give you after okay. our discussion right. a link to that whole thing so you can include it okay. along with this video okay. post. Okay, perfect. So the other thing we haven't talked much about is modality, where you inject the stem cells. Okay. So I each time I do treatment at Centiel, I do IV umbilical cord stem cells. And this okay. is in high quantity, like a hundred to hundred and fifty million. Okay. Muscle injections. And I typically will inject those into muscles that have atrophied. Like my left tricep is like 50, 60% wasted right. away. It's been your, so it's been your trouble frequently. spot, right? Your worst one, your, your worst My worst spot. spot. Yeah. Both triceps are, are down, but the left is way worse. Okay. Um, I've also injected it into joints, but that's more for arthritic pain than okay. it is for ALS. Okay. But everyone ought to know, I have put them in the joints. Okay. Then the catheterization to the carotid, uh, yes. intrathecal, also called lumbar puncture. And then I also did nasal cavity injections. Oof. I don't know if I'm going to do those again. <laughs> that sounds that sounds bad. Was that, was it that... was painful. <laughs> I even got a really bad bloody nose from one of them. Mm. But the hypothesis was maybe some of those cord, umbilical cord stem cells could pass through the blood-brain barrier. Right. And so I did some there. Uh, so six different modalities, three different types of stem cells, all right. in a, a collection. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really think there's anything other than the joint stem cells, the nasal cavity stem cells that I won't likely continue to do. Okay. Because so you're, it, out the, you're out on the you're out on those two. The 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 direct injection, the uh, stem. You're not going to do the nasal cavity. And the joint injections anymore because there's no well, reason. Well, I you won't don't... do the joint for ALS. I may do the joint oh, okay. for arthritic pain again. I see. 
Gotcha. So the, the, the data shows people seem to have improvement with joint pain for about a year. The anti-inflammatory effects of umbilical okay. cord stem cells okay. seem to last about a year. Okay. And the truth is I'm starting to get a little bit more arthritic pain when I'm doing my workouts at the gym right now okay. the last few months. Okay. So I may, I may do that again. But I just want ALS patients, I don't want them to misunderstand my, my motive for doing those isn't to cure ALS. It is to get rid of the pain in the joints. <laughs> I got you. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a look just one, one real quick at this document that you gave us. Let's just let's let's just do a quick summary of this real quick. Uh, the locations, because that's what, again, everybody's, we want to condense this down. Sure. Centiel is in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, Wu Medical Center is in Beijing. Puwa is, your, is the one that you've recently looked at. Have you had a treatment in Puwa yet, or is that the one you were considering? No, I was considering it. I okay. toured Puhua. I was very impressed with their facilities. Their facilities okay. look like a high-end, high-tech, modern U.S. hospital. Okay. The other thing I like about Puhua is they claim to extract the neurostem cells themselves. Okay. And I believe that fresh stem cells are superior to stem cells that have been grown in a petri dish over many months to years gotcha. uh, there are growth factor cells and other types of cells that exist in step in with the stem cell you know solution so All to right. speak and i like the idea of them extracting their own that also eliminates one other variable from the supply chain okay so okay. it's it's also convenient for me because i speak chinese fluently while right. I was in Beijing, it was only a 45 hour, 45 minute uh, drive to get over to Puhua Hospital. I okay. went over there. I was very impressed. They're more expensive than the Wu Medical Center, mm -hmm. but I'll probably go there next time to right. to get the freshly extracted uh, neuro stem cells. They're, they're not doing the catheter, catheterization procedure at Puhua, right? That'll be strictly interesting. Not that I'm aware so, of. Okay. But I haven't specifically asked them on that. For, for the folks out there, I mean, to do a you know, they literally put a catheter in your wrist, you know, up through your arm into your brain, right at the base of your brain right. stem, right, Warren? So that's a pretty big procedure, yeah. and that has to be Yeah, it's a big procedure, and it t I had to get my confidence up with right. uh, Centiel sure. because, and verify through due diligence that they'd never had an incident doing that to get confident enough to do it. It would be great to try neuro stem cells okay. um, with a catheterization, but... Okay. I don't know if Puhua does that, but that'll okay. be on my discussions in my future conversations with them. And I maintain a dialogue with them, and I'm looking to go there maybe in a couple of months. Okay. Then Stemetics. Stemetics, I went the one time. The, the service was great, mm -hmm. but the cost for 5 million stem cells is dramatically higher than other facilities outside of the country. And was that I think or was that uh, sorry that was, was that... intrathecal, correct? Okay, okay, but interesting. I I think the the data from the clinical trial suggests that fifty to seventy million is a bit more of a sweet spot where okay. where they're showing a lot of benefit, okay. and uh, quantity I think can be king here. Okay, uh, I I did the local stem cells of umbilical cord stem cells with the nasal cavity, joint injections, okay. the muscle injections at East West Health in Utah. East West Health, okay. And then Han Young University and CoreStem, I have not been there. I've just done research with them and their facilities that have a lot of credentials, a lot of experience, but I haven't actually been there yet. A lot of Americans now uh, seem to be choosing Korea. Um, uh, you know, several people have gone over um, and... We don't have the data, unfortunately, yet. I haven't found anybody who's had your, your level of success or even a Matt Bellina yet, frankly, uh, from core stem or neural stem or neuronata, if you will. Uh, and so um, we're not sure on those yet. And we're open to everything. I want to be clear. You know, this is a terminal illness. And, you know, that's why we're doing this. And why we're talking about this today is because, you know, we have to have some sort of options. You know, you know personally for me, I'll be clear, you know, uh, I... I would take the Neuron product in a second if I could, but, you know, obviously, Warren, that's not an option yet. If I could do Neuron, the brainstorm, I would do it. Yes. And But I was declined from the trial. I'm on a wait list for their hospital program. 
understand. Uh, hopefully in the future, they'll have a expanded access program and we'll be able to do that. If I could, I would. Right. Uh, well, their I, trial I is, experiences stronger results as, as anybody. But there's yeah. also strong, very strong phase one trial that just came out just in the last couple months with neuro stem cells in the U.S. So we're probably eight to 10 years away from from seeing that through phase two and phase three. But okay. the, the early results of the phase one of, of the neuro stem cells in the U.S. were very, very strong and compelling. And that helped put me over the over the fence to go could do them in China. Explain just really quickly that what when you say neuro cells, what what do you mean? Neural cells, what do you mean there? You're talking about they're literally they're literally taking fetuses who have passed that have passed away right. and using brain and and spinal tissue to derive the stem cells. Now that from a moral standpoint was a big issue for me, which Understood. is why it took me nine months before I went and did it. I needed to be confident there was no financial incentive for anybody to abort a child. I'm Great. confident that there is none. Okay. There, There's a huge number, like 13 million abortions in China a year. and um, But there's not a financial incentive from the due diligence I've done to encourage anybody to abort a child but once the child is aborted or lost naturally then they're taking those the stem cells from there and extracting those and that's the same thing they're doing in the clinical trial in the u.s i understand okay. but i'm ab adamantly against a financial incentive me too to encourage, encourage. a possible a termination or an abortion no question adamantly oh, against that they're the most potent by far I very much agree. And think of this, the stem cells and cells at the time that a brain is growing are likely designed to grow neuro tissue, right? brain yep. tissue. Stem cells in 54 year old like me are likely designed and there to repair damage in the body because the brain's exactly. already formed. Exactly. So I think the theory, and this is all theory, stem cell expert, I think, don't even understand more than 2% of all the workings of all these stem cells. Great. It's definitely a new, a new science. But the theory is those stem cells are growing and enhancing brain tissue development at that phase. Maybe they could grow and repair. But that's very theoretical. Almost all of this is theoretical. I'm putting up this little slide here that just briefly talks about the types of stem cells again. So we have bone marrow uh, derived, which are the autologous cells that Neuron is using and, and where you've had done uh, a hip aspiration in, in uh, Mexico. Uh, and China, yeah. I believe, is using that as well, right? So then you have yep. the adipose tissue, which are the fat uh, stem cells, which uh, you know are less common for ALS treatment. Uh, the umbilical, which are which are common uh, in in Mexico, right? That's that's done at, at, at in Guadalajara uh, yeah. by by intravenous, I believe. Is that right? And then you have the amniotic, yep. uh, and then hum, human epithelial uh, amniotic uh, from the uh, from the fetal sac, I guess. Correct. And then the neural, correct. which is kind of the more controversial ones. You know, I've had uh, three of the ones in blue. I've treated with it. The one oh, in okay. yellow, I'm likely going to treat in the near future. Okay. So gotcha. the amniotic epithelial from the amniotic sac, I'm likely going to do treatment with that in the near future. There's really promising, okay. strong results. Uh, they haven't been through all the you know, phases of clinical trials yet, okay. but the preliminary data looks really, really strong. But I have done the ones in blue, bone okay. marrow, in blue. umbilical cord, mm -hmm. and neuro stem cells. I have not done blood-based ones, okay. although I'm researching and looking at that. Okay. And I have not done amniotic fluid stem cells yet. Okay. And then when we say modalities, what you mean by that is the type of delivery systems, more or less. Uh, Correct. So uh, the, the, the six that, that, you know, that exist, more or less, you have intravenous, of course, uh, muscle injection, which is directly in the uh, into the muscle, which you do correctly point out is not, not really the root cause of ALS, because we know that happens in the brain and the spinal cord, primarily. Yeah. Uh, joint, uh, not really the root of ALS, again. But especially number four and number five there, the catheterization to the carotid artery to get those cells right 
into the base of the brain. So you're basically almost flushing the brain with uh, with healthy stem cells uh, in order to try to exactly. uh, knock out some of that neuroinflammation. And then the last one, of course, uh, which is the foundation of the neuron trial is, of course, the intrathecal lumbar puncture. Exactly. So, when you look at those, those two, where do motor neurons exist? Upper motor neurons are at the top of the brain. Lower motor neurons at the bottom of the brain and go down the spine. So you got to get the stem cells or the drug or the treatment to the place that the neurons are dying. That's exactly and right. that's why those two are first and foremost. The catheterization procedure is something that, that you developed with, uh, what, who was it, Dr. Was it Dr. Espinoza in Mexico? Is that, is Ra that Rafael Gonzalez. Gonzalez, I'm sorry. Him. Yeah. But, but Espinoza is, is doctor actually down at the clinic. So. That is truly amazing. And I think that that is what I'd like people to take most out of this interview is that, you know, uh, as good as Neuron appears to be, and it certainly, you know, many, you, you all have watched my videos and, and know that I've pounded those, uh, those patients almost into the ground, screaming and yelling about how well they've done. But, you know, this, this, this brain catheter procedure, I believe, Warren, could be, could be the missing link to this. Um, would you, do you feel comfortable talking about, uh, you know, your discussions with, uh, with Dr. Bedlack about, you know, what he said to you when you, when you first visited him after having some of these treatments? And if you don't, I mean, that's not a problem. Well, I improved so much by the time I had seen uh, Richard Bedlack. And uh, my protocol was developed by then. I had done many different treatments of stem cells and, and other types of treatments. And so because I was improving so much, he suggested that I no longer do the carotid artery injection because there is some stroke risk mm -hmm, right um and so i never i only did two and then after that i never did it again until last month and i re i went back to doing it again because i started declining a little bit again okay. in a little bit of strength and increased fasciculations and cramps um and so i did it again i'll probably wait a while again before i do it again but i think I don't have full confidence that stem cells are going to cure ALS single-handedly, but I believe that they may be able to maintain it with enough treatments and enough variety of stem cells in enough modalities for Agreed. injection location to potentially maintain and keep progression from occurring. Okay. So I will likely continue with it, but not super frequent. I, but I will do the lumbar puncture, intrathecal injections, um, probably every 60 to 75 days okay. ongoing. Okay. So Warren, one of the other interesting things is that this is a little more off the topic of stem cells, but needless to say, with the recent kind of success that uh, the Biogen trial had with the SOD1 gene, you know, you and I have believed strongly in a genetic component for ALS for quite some time. Tell us a little bit about this interesting document where you had a complete genome mapping, right, at, from some place in Europe, yes. and they found a, a malfunction or a mutation in something called the TRIP4 gene. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so what happened was uh, around September, October of, of 2018, I had my full genome map with New Amsterdam Genomics. Okay. They did a really great job. Uh, the CEO and my doctor, my functional medicine doctor, and I had a conversation. I saw on there that I had a TRIP4, TRIP4 uh, genetic mutation or, or problem with that gene. And it has historically been associated with spinal muscular atrophy. And since I have atrophy and I have some spine issues, which are very common with ALS, that stood out to me. I saw that in the report. So right. during the conversation with the CEO of New Amsterdam Genomics, I asked him about that gene. And at that point in time, it had not been connected or associated with ALS. Well, he went and did a bunch more research on it. And December 16th of last year, it was finally connected and associated with ALS.
Wow. So I have, it's amazing. I have a, a, a gene that is now officially a, you know, okay. uh, a mutant related and connected with ALS. Right. Similar to uh, how the SOD1 uh, functions. And one of the things that was interesting was, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the recent success was Zolgensma, the SMA drug. And that they actually came up with a curative uh, compound for that. Zolgensma is curative. Uh, that they were putting into babies, you know, and uh, which I think is fantastic. And then on top of that, you add the, the Biogen news that uh, uh, Torferson seems to be, uh, people have seen the video of the gentleman dancing around, you know, on, at, in his front yard and, and on this porch uh, who has the SOD1 gene. So I think what we're learning, Warren, is that, you know, ALS, maybe as you believed as much as 80%, I think was the number you might have given me, could, you know, could possibly be, cured with gene therapy it's just identifying those i think both are contributors in most als patients okay. um, i don't think they have found even a small fraction of the genes that are defective okay. uh, they found many you know a dozen plus but right. i think there are many many others and you know mine is a brand new one just barely found just a few months ago mm -hmm. and uh so I would guess that genetics are likely involved in a majority of cases, but environmental factors clearly are triggering it, exacerbating right. it, or enhancing the onset. Yeah. If it was Definitely. only genetic, why then maybe ALS would be manifesting in small children, but exactly. it doesn't. It waits until there's enough wear and tear or age or environmental pollutants or okay. other contaminants, to, I think, to trigger and start it. So just like the BMAA neurotoxin that's in blue-green algae, that is not 100% proven, but probably 99% proven to be one of the many triggers that enhance it. Sure. So I think we all have a different level of genetic weakness. I agree. Just like every bridge in the world is a little different. They might have a similar design, but every bridge is its own fundamental physical properties. And every one of those bridges carries different cargo, is exposed to different rust, different, right. different strains and stressors. If those strains and stressors get high enough, then they trigger that predisposition or genetic weakness. That's my theory. No, I agree. And I think that that's also... By and large, the the, uh, the same theory as Dr. Appel's down in Houston. Um, you know, he likes to say that that you know the genetics are what loads the gun, and then of course the environment is what kind of pulls the trigger. You know, that's his little favorite saying, and I agree with that. Otherwise, people would be getting sick uh, much earlier in life. Um, I've had 1.66 billion stem cells okay. injected to date. That's your total. Through 1.66 billion. Okay. And then there's a bunch of growth factor cells, probably 390,000 growth factor cells that are with those. So I'm over 2 billion cells transplanted. Okay. Uh, that's probably more than anyone I'm aware of that's had ALS. Sure. Sure. Um, but I think to not continue to do it would be exposing myself to a huge risk of progressing again. And sure. when I'm doing it, I'm seeing the indicators all go f improve okay and uh so i i definitely will continue on on doing ongoing maintenance treatments how do you notice a difference when you get your uh your uh your treatments can you see this yeah we can see it mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to make out exactly what's going on but do you have some some oh yeah i see it there yep right on your yep front side of your delt there it looks like that would be about 30 percent as intense as it was a month ago before I did the catheterization and the, oh, and wow. the stem cells in China. Wow. And I did a pretty intense 50-minute uh, exercise workout this morning. A month ago, if I did an exercise workout like that intensely, those fasciculations would be just shaking oh, three boy. times more intense. Okay, okay. Now, so, so everybody knows the fasciculations have never gone away since November, Thanksgiving time, 2017. Okay. They just have spread throughout the whole rest of the body. So if I were to take my shirt off, you'd see my pecs, my back, everywhere fasciculating. 
my lower body fasciculates much, much milder. So I think okay. the, the motor neuron depth in the lower body is much less than the upper body. So, okay, well, that's, uh, this is all great information and you're going to continue doing the stem cells and doing the research for everybody out there. But uh, I'd, I would like to, to get with you and we'll post uh, the relevant documents for people that, uh, that you're willing to share. Uh, at the link uh, below here uh, in the in the uh, description so that you guys can go in there and look at exactly what Warren's latest protocol is uh, and uh, and then make your own you know decisions on how you want to proceed uh, but I want to say thanks again for everything and uh, you know uh, do you want me to post your Facebook address as well and so people can contact you are you okay with that or would you that's fine sure. okay. that's fine okay awesome all right thank well, you Warren, thank you so much and we'll uh, we'll see you soon okay thanks all right. Okay, there you go. Mr. Warren Osborne. Wow, what an interview. Um, fascinating to learn that there are options um, and that these things are real. Okay, Warren Osborne is highly credible, highly intelligent. I just I don't think that there's any doubt over whether or not what he's saying and is what he believes and what his results are. Okay. Um, be sure you're following uh, my uh, YouTube channel here at ALS News Now. Uh, subscribe, if you will, and also be sure to, to follow me on Twitter at ALS underscore now. And also, uh, make sure that you're with us at No More Excuses on Facebook. Um, earlier this year, um, Craig, uh, Annie, myself, we began to, <clears throat> through this channel and through Contagious for a Cure, we began to identify three therapies. Um one of those therapies um, is Dr. Appel's Treg procedure uh, down in Houston. The other is a copper compound named CUATSM, and the third one is the one that that we would desperately love to have. It is currently stuck in uh, an FDA phase three trial. It is the Neuron product by Brainstorm Therapeutics, an Israeli company, and, and the reason I put this up here today is because I want to make something clear that. We all acknowledge that Brainstorm is by far and away the pre or, or the neuron procedure from, from Brainstorm is by every measure the premier product. It is the one that we all desperately want to have in the ALS community right now. We've tried everything under the sun, uh, rallying at the FDA, asking the FDA. Uh, now we're focusing on getting an executive order that would force the FDA to create a non-binding third-party analysis option to where Brainstorm could apply for approval for this procedure right now without fear of losing their entire third-party trial. The way it works currently is it's all in. You, sub you say to the FDA, we want to file an IA. And interim analysis, basically what happens is the trial is stopped, the data is collected, and the FDA says, yep, you're good, or no, you're not. And if the problem is, is that if they say you're not, you lose it all. It's over. And we cannot take that risk. Brainstorm cannot take that risk. So what we need is the President of the United States to come in and to order the FDA to create this third-party non-binding uh, analysis option. And if, if we do that, I believe we're going to find that the company would be willing to apply because there would be no risk. There'd be no point in doing it uh, or not in doing it now. Okay. Um, and so you've seen the results from war and many of you might be watching this video for the first time. Uh, and I just want to give you just a quick bit of background. Um, Matt Bellina received the Neuron product under right to try uh, you know, back in 2016, I believe this video will kind of say it all. If you'll notice what's happening here is this is Matt Bellina. Matt was next to the president at the signing of the right to try law in a wheelchair. Okay. Now this is with heavy, heavy amounts of assistance, but needless to say, this is stunning. Uh, this is Matt after, uh, receiving the full dose of neuron, three injections of the product as per the trial. Now he was not in the trial. He was under right to try. Uh, the only person that got it, uh, thank God he did, because these are the results it's producing. I want you to see this uh, fascinating result here at the end. This is him doing 
um, kind of squats on this machine. And th this is unbelievable, folks. Absolutely incredible. And then we go back to the very first part of the video, uh, before and after, side by side. This is Matt earlier on in the process. He had to use his arms to pull himself up. On the right side of the video, he is now standing up unassisted. I mean, this is, this, folks, this is, this is, this is why we want neuron. This is why we must have it. And this is why I wish we could put, uh, frankly, the politics aside and all this nonsense and just go for broke and ask the president to help us. We need his help. Now, um, let's go back into the stem cell therapies just for a moment. Um, this is the neuron product again. Just, just quickly, this is our problem. The reason why people are going to China and going to Mexico right now is because they don't have any choice. They do not have a choice. It's either go or die. And as you can see here in 2017 through 2019, the phase three trial for neuron is, is underway currently. However, it is very far behind, sadly. Um, and that is strictly as a result of um, the, the trial design, the way it was designed, the, what the FDA required, uh, 14 trips to Boston for a, or, or California or any one of these sites. Uh, I believe there's six trial sites nationwide, self-funded 100% of the way. You got, or not, not quite 100%. There's a small, very small stipend, but you know the average trialee is going to pay for 14 airplane tickets, um, and you know 100 of these people, sadly, tragically, are going to receive placebo and be watched uh, as they die. Um, so many people have said, "Well, I really don't want to get in the trial, so you know what I'm going to do." Uh, I'm going to take my chances and go to Mexico or I'm going to go to Korea or I'm going to go to uh, China and they are going, trust me, they are, um, you know, and, and some people are having results. You know, you just saw a great example of a guy who did have some good results. Um, I'd like to show you now just a, a couple of things that Warren sent. Um, let's take a look uh, just briefly at the facility there. This is, this is Wu medical center in China. This is their physical therapy room. So, you know, pretty nice. Um, let's look at this. Uh, this is Mexico. This is the cath lab at Cintil, uh in Guadalajara, Mexico. This is actually Warren. Uh, this, is his, uh, this is his body, his chest cavity. He's getting uh, a catheter put through his wrist all the way up into the carotid artery where the stem cells are being placed right at the base of his brain. So it's bypassing the, the blood-brain barrier and going right into the brain. Uh, revolutionary technique that he and his doctor designed together, and I, I, I love it. I think it's aggressive. It's bold. And, uh, you know, what we're going to do here is continue to show you options, to give you options to treat your ALS. It's that simple. Um, and I want to say thank you to, to Warren Osborne for doing this. I want to say thank you for watching. And if you would, please subscribe and make sure you're following us at No More Excuses on Facebook and the group. Uh, and also at uh, on my Twitter at ALS now, uh, ALS underscore now. Sorry about that. And I'm going to sign off now. We'll see you again on the next video. Thank you. <laughs>